for tonight. Well, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, in for that free shit. It's a bit of an interesting one, you know. Um, I don't know how big of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan you are, but uh, I, there is a you Xbox even have to giveaway. Ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an Xbox giveaway, and they are. Let me just pull this up. It is the first ever pizza scented Xbox and TMNT Mutant Mayhem controllers. <laughs> but pizza scented. Pizza scented. You heard that right, guys. <laughs> Uh, designed to deliver the smell of the turtle's beloved meal to your game time. These exclusive Xbox wireless controllers come with a built-in scent and diffuser shaped like a delicious slice of New York za. <laughs> the controller comes in four variations, each representing the signature colors, weapons, and personality of a turtle brother. <laughs> so, if you are intrigued by this and you would like to try to receive one of these... Fans can enter to win the wireless controller by following the Xbox Game Pass on Twitter and retweeting the official Xbox Game Pass sweepstakes tweet. The giveaway will run from July 24th through August 13th. Well, you know, it, it's a big departure from the typical Cheeto stains on most controllers these days. <laughs> so, is, yeah. They get... so give you full permission to just go ham with the pizza. Oh, uh, and speaking of uh, pizza, if you are in New York City, um, they are... Offering you to come into the Xbox Gaming Lounge at the Microsoft Experience Center on 5th Avenue from 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on August 2nd to load up and have a game day, I guess. Uh, and you get to <laughs> check out the controllers in person. <laughs> so do they offer like a like a free sniffing? You sniff, yeah. It yeah. kind of sounds like they're having a little game day. You know, come in, play some games with the controllers, sniff them real mm. good, I guess. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to be able to say that they went to New York City to smell a controller? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're uh, putting this up on the stream, but the pictures of the controllers are pretty cool. And the pizza diffusers <laughs> kind of <laughs> stick out the back. So it looks like the, you just have like the crust <laughs> sticking out. <laughs> they just have like these little diff diffusing things. So it's like, yeah, so it's not the plastic that smells like pizza. Right, right. It's whatever this attachment diffuser. It is oh, also okay. shaped like a pizza. <laughs> uh, I I am very puzzled by this, and I know uh, <laughs> I know my fat ass would just try to eat it by accident. Oh man, I, I don't know if that'd make you tired of pizza or to want pizza more. Oh. I don't know. You you smoke a lot. You just uh, be like, oh damn, I'm ordering. That's true. That's true. Just, oh, here I go again. Uh, enough of this pizza talk. You're going to be putting on uh, some serious diabetes with all these carbs. Oh, let's, let's start yeah. the show. Welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows. I am your host Orion, bringing you and I'm again. Host Sam. Oh, we we, we got <laughs> monsters, <laughs> news, and homebrews with, with none of the synchronization. But we, no, we got no, some. We're doing awful tonight. <laughs> uh, but we got some guests with us this week. Uh, Ramen Packet Gaming. Why don't you two introduce yourselves? Fantastic. All right, highest roll goes first. I got a ten. What you get? Uh, I got a one. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, for Ramen Packet Gaming, a pretty new company at the moment. We try and put out weekly one-page RPGs. We have rodents, revolvers, vaguely Street Fighter resemble but legally distinct knockoffs. Right. Our own radio <laughs> show that lacks the pizza scent. Unfortunately, <laughs> we did not bring any pizza scented. Missed opportunity, yet. truly. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly an idea for our next product. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. So yeah, I'm Richard, this is Will, and thank you for having us on. Yeah, happy to have uh, you. Absolutely. Like, you know, someone had to, you know, clean the scent of pizza out of the studio with ramen packet. You know, a, a good dusting uh, here and there goes a long way. You know, this reminds me, I had a friend a long time ago, who, whenever he would get like a plain pizza, he would pop open some ramen packets. And just like put the seasoning on top, 
and uh, I have mixed I mean, feelings about this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how I feel. That is deeply horrifying, but also I respect it. <laughs> like, you give me a curiosity. You're a company out of a college, which means that yeah. instant noodles are a culinary staple, and you just hit a point where you <laughs> have to experiment with what you have. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I've seen some interesting things, and that memory just kind of awakened. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I'm just fortunate to live near like a Ivy League high uh, high school, and th they get a lot of uh, exchange students, and like uh, they got this whole boarding school thing going on. And as a result, uh, this store that's like half a mile from there is the only place in my area that sells good ramen. Like, <laughs> like I got uh, this ramen right here. Like, oh, I look, love those ones. Yeah, see, we're like ready it, to go today. Yeah, like, we're not like, sponsored dude. by them, but we should be. <laughs> uh, Nissan, if you want to sponsor this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sponsors, please. <laughs> we do love your ramen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the ones that I really like are the the ones that come in like the square ones, you know, and they have like the red top. Oh, the soba. Um, yeah, yeah, the soba. Yeah. So good. <laughs> the, like the teriyaki ones. Oh, yes. Sorry, just me fiddling with my light while I <laughs> Well, it's funny. Uh, Ours was definitely one of those name first, company second. When we realized mm. Ramen Pack Gaming spells out RPG, we were then committed, and we have dived too deep, and now we're stuck with it. Oh my god, you're a genius. Mm. <laughs> right? <laughs> that That's next level marketing. Like, the Trump move aside, we got fifth dimensional checkers over here. <laughs> yeah, funny yeah. enough, uh, the name, coincidentally enough, is also the one of a uh, board game which with which we have been having a bit of a rivalry with the past few weeks. Thankfully, we've Ooh. gotten them off of the first page of Google, and we are very happy about that. Yeah, we have Victory! a casual, <laughs> yeah, <it's like laughs> casual rivalry with Ramen Fury. They don't know we exist, but our entire goal was to get famous <laughs> enough Ooh, to be above Fury. them on the search results. Uh, I, I feel that, because uh, we had a little bit of a similar thing going on with Nerd Militia, not to be confused oh. with uh, the nerd <laughs> militia, which is uh, our uh, production that we got going on here. Uh, I don't even. <laughs> well, you know what? So we're bigger than them now. So, but so hooray. they seemed to be some kind of entertainment horror SCP c company. I'm not sure. Like. <laughs> it, it seems like something that somebody started on a weekend while they were drinking. <laughs> they forgot about it. Yeah. Um, never really committed to it, but you know, all the better for us. A cool idea. Get those crime really search know. results. <laughs> yeah, like our literally our first business objective was to find every account we could to claim ramen packet gaming across the entire mm. internet. Like we don't have TikToks, but we want the ability to have them if needed. Mm. Right. I mean we we technically You gotta have, have options. <laughs> Trademark like, <laughs> we keep trying to put out as much like variety as we can. It's always interesting what people bite on because we'll be like, "Hey, we have this complex, crunchy strategy game." Rolls eyes. How would you like to be a werewolf in Shadow Dark? Four hundred downloads the next minute. I'm like, "Oh, well, yeah. I, that's a big deal." No one told us about. I, I right would say that's amazing. Damn. <laughs> oh yeah, like I agree. Yeah, for sure. We literally had a folder we dusted off, oh. and we were trying to work on a homebrew thing. We're like, we can make this work for Shadow Dark, mm. right? Shadow Dark's cool. I mean, Shadow Dark Arcane Library, Shadow Dark. By the way, it's actually a pretty solid game. Mm. But we're at the point right now of like any game hits our table, we play test it, we do a radio show from it, we steal from it, we prepare our next project. I really I love, love to keep it going. These sorts of things. Hmm. Oh yeah, like. Our last big drop-in game we had, we were running the My Little Pony RPG of all things, just to kind of force <laughs> our more like hardcore dungeon delving, min-maxing players to use friendship. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It devolves into like the deepest uh, seats of uh, fucking uh, anime, uh, like fairy tale, where it's just like, "Ha, huh, friendship is my power." It really did, though. Like, I will lose because I have friends by my side. <laughs> Well, literally, the one player who ran off because they didn't have friendship kept trying to teleport to a city, and it gave them exactly half the distance each time. Ooh. It took a while for them to realize the mathematical impossibility. Ah, <laughs> oh, dude. 
Uh, yeah, half the distance every time, but point. eventually you're only moving one step, so you might as well put one foot in front of the other. Oh man, that would be awful. <laughs> Yeah, that one was a highlight. Another one we ran was Trash Pandas, where it's four raccoons trying to enter illegal street racing tournaments. Uh, I am gung ho for this. this. (laughs) I live for it. (laughs) Like, I think the highlight is we hit a moment of peak drama where I had described a character as Hollywood Hulk Hogan, and they went to Denny's (laughs) with Hollywood Hulk Hogan, like you do. And then because they stole John Wick's car and his dog, I had some really random characters for the street racers in this game. They had successfully managed to steal John Wick's car and his dog, so Hollywood Hulk Hogan heroically jumped in front of a bullet for them. And that is the single favorite thing I've ever had happen while running a tabletop RPG. Uh, I have to ask, is is this inspired at all by Wacky Races? Because that's good. I love it. Wacky Races? You've never heard of Wacky Races? I am unaware of this. Uh, Hanna-Barbera was before your time, my friend. Before my time. <laughs> For me, it was one of those I saw Wacky Races as, you're sick on a school day, so they're playing old reruns. So yeah. I like, she just was on the tail end of that. It was basically the most ambitious crossover since the Marvel Cinematic Universe for the characters that showed up in Wacky Races, and I'm not Whoa. exaggerating. <laughs> Far, eh? it, it, it really <laughs> was. Like, dude, they had, like, all the people f- from across their cartoons all in one show, and I don't even know if you could do that today, but if you did, it would make for one hell of a show. Like, if they had, like, a anime Wacky Races... It, it would break the internet. Hmm. Absolutely. Interesting, interesting. Is this anything like the Simpsons home run? <laughs> a Simpsons hit and run. <laughs> it can be if you want Did you play. hear that they're bringing that game back? <laughs> oh, dude, there's only one quote I know from that game, but I, oh, I know it by God. heart. <laughs> what a time to be alive. <laughs> we got aliens, we got the Simpsons. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, one of my goals for life, I was born the same year as The Simpsons started airing. And I have one goal as a person, to outlive The Simpsons. That is it. That is my one objective. And I don't know if I'll make it. What do you think will last longer, syndicated Mm. weekly television or me? (laughs) This is actually a tough one because I can't remember the last time most people have given a fuck about The Simpsons. So your odds are looking good. The last time they predicted something. Ooh, yeah. What if they predicted that he'll outlive them? Oh, we show up in the next Here's episode. The thing, <laughs> well, we're going to have to binge watch to find out. <laughs> if I could show up on an episode of The Simpsons, that's peak celebrity status. Yeah. Like, I will have peaked, and mm. I'll be downhill from there. There's going to be a company that they talk about ramen gaming <laughs> on the news. <laughs> oh, that's something they would talk about on there. Like, oh, hey, uh, ramen packet over here. Oh, who the fuck names themselves after a ramen packet? These guys. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> this is Honestly. our call out to the Simpsons. <laughs> I mean, our tagline's pretty good, though. Game's simple enough. You can learn them at times it takes your soup to cook. Like, we got this down to a marketing science. Okay. Honestly, okay. this is uh, some god tier marketing. If I've ever seen any. And the games are passable. Mm. Well, that's the first step so, right there. <laughs> so, is there no issue with using the word ramen? It's not their copyrighted bird. I don't think ramen is trademarked. I just no, think it's just... no, it's just a nice. general dish. What a way to live. What a way to live. Perfect. Ramen, if it gets trademarked, that signifies yeah. the end of the universe as we know it. <laughs> so many <laughs> companies would fall. For the amount of ramen I've eaten in my life, I'm pretty sure I'm like legally indistinguishable from it at this point. Yeah. Like, if you are what you eat, I'm probably like 50% ramen anyway. Yeah, it's like those it. TikToks where they like uh, take a uh, little ramen uh, things, they like break it up, and then they like get it wet, and then like use use it to like fill in cracks <laughs> on like uh, oh, yeah. wooden banisters, and it's just like, why why would you do that? Oh, just use God. sawdust and glue, you dumb! Like, I, I'm I'm done. I can't I can't even. If for some reason you don't have cock, you have ramen. You can just use ramen. <laughs> It's not as bad as the ramen burger a friend of mine made, where he didn't have burger buns, so he literally used the two, like, ramen noodle packaged as the burger buns for a hamburger to eat. 
I, I'm is, skeptical, but intrigued. <laughs> like, you have to cook I just some want to talk. Bit, just to, like, crack an egg in there and cook it a bit to make it, like, have the structure. My friend lived. I just That's have a question for him. Of course. <laughs> He's got a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> we got to bring him on. I just want to talk real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, the whole episode is just going to be us talking about various things you can do with ramen. Like when my wife uh, takes uh, ramen noodles, uh, she'll and rather than make a soup, like she'll uh, get them all good and ready to go, throw them in a frying pan with some beef, and like she'll just uh, get the ramen packet, kind of like put that over the top, and like a couple other things, like maybe a little bit of soy sauce, and she'll fry that shit up, and it's amazing. You know, um, oh, that is fantastic. Oh, sorry, On the opposite end of the spectrum, imagine using ramen as a cereal. Ew. <laughs> you <Why>? know, the <laughs> first part about that is, before I got into, like, gaming as a career option, I was a trained chef. I'm afraid. So, like, <laughs> that's the running joke. It's so, like, oh, yeah, I have five years culinary experience. And here I am putting prime rib in my instant noodles because I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know... <laughs> to our listeners, I want you to put a comment on how you like your ramen and tell us how we're degenerates for liking it this way. <laughs> I, I'm just like, damn. He, he's out of line, but he's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Let him cook. Let him cook. <laughs> Let him cook. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, let him cook. <laughs> So, I, I got to know, uh, getting on uh, track to uh, your gaming philosophy, is there, like, a core mechanic that you try to include that, like, really simplifies everything? Like, something that ties it all together. Your uh, your ramen packet to every uh, bowl that you're making here, you know? What? See, that's the <laughs> irony of it is you try, we make it that you have to fit 12-point point font on a single sheet of paper that's also the character sheet. But each game, we've <laughs> deliberately used a different core mechanic to try and really deep dive into those mechanics. Ooh. Like our Cobalt and Bad Credit mechanic, we took the core, we call it the Pony Engine, which is really just exploding dice that change the dice place each roll. For our mm. Rodent Revolvers, we switched out randomization with a poker system, where you're effectively mm. playing a bluffing card game. So right now we're in such an experimental phase hmm. that we deliberately try to try out a new core game engine each one-page game, just Ooh. so we can kind of, while working on our own proprietary game system, get the best sampling we can. Okay. Experimenting has also solidified my love for the roll-under system and has kind of raised my disdain for d d system as a whole, because once you get to one-page like wow this is so clean and efficient i don't need to worry about seven thousand different features that i'm never going to use whoopee but the counterpoint to that though is if your system's too simple people will never play two weeks in a row like rodents and revolt is fantastic you're playing your west world inspired genetically modified raccoon escaping a theme park that entertains people once but once you fired that bullet you're not going to have them show up week for week to want to play that or something yeah. more crunchy like 5e or project black flag i believe it's called tales of arcadia now you kind of get that like recurring theme mm -hmm. so we're very flip-flopping that's kind of the point is we make our play test group try something new every week whether they want to or not so we can get as much data as possible like, i love that you describe 5e as uh, crunchy because <laughs> i <laughs> i know we're going to get some people in the comments on that no one. <laughs> we had a guest who described 5e as crunchy we had a whole conversation about this it's crunchy I mean, compared to Cairn. Yeah, which they, I think they were talking about the math, right? The math being very crunchy or something like that? It's less that 5e is crunchy and more... Mm. It's kind of like the gallbladder. The where gallbladder. it's existed for so long that it's not really for an actual feature as designed anymore. So like, <laughs> when we try and teach 5e to new players... What an analogy. Have brick walls, <laughs> just, just mechanics that depend on you being more familiar uh -huh. with role-playing in general. Uh -huh. Where, mm. like, for example, Shadow Dark, I can grab a, play, a player off the street and be like, hey, come play this game, and have decent success. If I go straight into Pathfinder, I have to have their character sheets written and memorized so I can teach someone how to use it while they play it. Yeah, like, that's one of the biggest issues I have yeah. as a DM. Like, mm -hmm. I, I have to know the characters... Uh, I have to know the players' characters better than they do, and... 
it's annoying that I have to educate people on how to use their character sheet six months into a campaign still. You know? Yeah, I like, get that. For sure. Absolutely. Like, because I do drop and play mostly, since of our nature of our playtest group being a drop in environment, I hit interesting points where not only do I have to know people's characters, but I've literally said the phrase, listen, I can't tell if, check if you're cheating. If you're playing something mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm playing against Yankee Pirate Psy Warrior, I don't have that memorized, and I have eight players, and three of them have don't know what a D10 looks like. So, <laughs> cheat responsibly. It's okay if you real. Cheat, as long as I can't tell. So if you make right. an athletics check, and you tell me it's a plus 12, and you're playing yeah. level 3, my basic mental math like, okay, where did you get an expertise? Oh, you're a fighter? I think mm. you're cheating me. But if you do it reasonably, like, oh, yeah, my passive perception is 18, sure, I'm not going to fact mm -hmm. check you. I got eight players to track, and one of you is literally three cobalts in a trench coat. I can see that, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, some people who may, you know, lie about their roles a little bit, you know, make a success if, you know, to, you know, something else. Yeah, so I just tell them. I mean, I think it's it is what it is, really, you know. It's like, I don't mind, but it's just the environment matters, like a long going yeah. crunchy campaign. I like saying crunchy because I'm talking <laughs> like instant noodle crunchy, like you can crumble them at a touch. Right, right. <laughs> like if I turn to blow like Eldritch Horror or New Edo or something that's actually mechanically intense, I would mm. need to curate a play group and not do that for convention style play. Hmm. It, it makes a lot of sense. Like uh, with what you're putting together, it's very like, okay, uh, very much like uh, how Magic the Gathering was when it was uh, first brought around. Like, it, it was something to occupy time at conventions when people had, like, you know, little s slots of, I don't know what to fucking do. Mm -hmm. Ain't much going on. Right. Exactly. Like, sure, we got sure. the club room booked for exactly three hours, and no one's bringing characters prepared in advance. So that means we have half an hour for character creation and two and a half hours to make a story happen. So... That's mm. why it became such a great testing environment, because you can be like, okay, we're playing kitchen table robots this week. Here's your robot. Here's the rules. We're going mm. in half an hour. Take your bathroom break now. We don't have time mm -hmm. to go over things. Please raise a hand if you have a question. Right. Yeah, and in terms of playtesting, it's not just that it's speedy. It's also we have such a variety of different players. Like, as you know, mentioned before, we have the sort of very technical players, but we have the role players as well. So that's a really great way to kind of discern, hey, okay, this is how good the system is for role playing versus this is how the math works. Is the math broken? Yeah, it's a good way to find out. Thanks, uh, Murder Hobo at slash Minimaxer. I mean, mm. I've, I've demoted him to Munchkin. He's gotten better. He's hit <laughs> Munchkin status. But last game we played, there was a, it was a new game we were playtesting, and one of the feats was the small feat. It didn't say the minimum size. So he's like, oh, can I play an ant to scale as an ant? Because I want to be a talking ant this week. <laughs> and I didn't know how to handle that information because the rules didn't say he couldn't. And I was morbidly curious to see where this went. Hmm. Understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And long story short, he was with the evil fey creatures about being pro eugenics. You can really can't. <laughs> <laughs> it was problematic to say the least. Right, right. <laughs> Damn, this is interesting. I like this. <laughs> like one of my personal favorite sessions is we spent like thirty minutes to mock mark up this polymorph system from ninth level gaming to be a magical girl game, and every player. Oh, yeah had brought their best transformation animation. One of them, like, literally did, like, from Bleach, a Bonkai, where a pocket watch transformed into a series of floating clock faces. And another Ooh. one with their exact outfit, but sparkly. And that <laughs> joke was amazing, where one does the full transformation and rides out the door on a tidal wave. Another does an awesome clock-ticking thing when a, vote, a murder of crows carries them down. The third person took the stairs. So we get a very mm. interesting group when you just kind of open up your game to who wants to try it. I, I really like that, and it's there is one thing that works very well with this, and I, I'd say it's probably a unintended aspect of everything, is uh, because things are so simple and quick to pick up, it's more child-friendly for people, that, parents like myself, that are trying to bring their kids into the hobby. Oh, absolutely. Like, we ran Cobalts with bad credit at a local game store a while back. Was just oh, what's with bad credit? Yeah. <laughs> it's our one page game you play a cobalt trying to got who got trapped in an mlm scheme trying to pay off their loan to their dragon overlord 
Oh, jeez. You could literally just <laughs> hand out three dice to every person in the game shop, one sheet of paper in front of them, and we could get them the basics of role-playing down. Mm-hmm. And mm. it was that simple. They went on their elaborate heist, they stole a coffee maker, mild war crimes were had, and it was good role-playing fun times. Hell yeah. That works very well. It's like, uh, I've tried a couple uh, times to do some uh, RPGs with my kids, and they're exceptionally good at the role-play aspect, but not very good at the, uh, you know, any amount of number crunch, because their children, maths and reading skills are not exactly where they should be. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I can, that, oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I can imagine that uh, having kids play D anD D could be very good for teaching those things. Oh, it absolutely is. About it. There's a ton of reading, you know, ton of small things to read, big words, you know, easy ish numbers. Well, it's interesting too. Like when we were talking different game systems and why we like them, like roll under systems are very straightforward. If your numbers mm. lower than the stat, you succeed. Right. Polymorph uses a system where you literally roll a different dice based on your character class, and if it lines up with the number on the table, it succeeds. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where you kind of slow roll people into the math, because quite frankly, and we play largely with college-age players, you'd be surprised at how much having to add a 5 to something can completely defeat a fourth-year business major. Yeah, yeah. I, I am not surprised, actually, because, like, there's a reason that 80% of businesses fail within the first five years. <laughs> <Bad math. laughs> yep. Like, our group's so fascinating, because we'll have, like, supply chain management players playing with the creative <laughs> writing students. So you get person mm-hmm. A being like, so what's the most economical way I can make this grain explosion? Person B being like, I am Bull the Adventurer. Follow me into the twilight. Uh, this works uh, so well. And I, I can really relate to that because uh, the last big campaign I ran uh, was Acquisitions Incorporated uh, in theme. Uh, True. Which is a very business-esque uh, kind of uh, casual fun kind of game. And one of our players was a business major going into accounting and stuff. So he proceeded to be the stoner druid building his weed empire, uh, marketing uh, the giggly bush from the the high forest. (laughs) Like One of my favorite long-running campaign stories is when they decide to get into municipal politics and run for mayor. (laughs) So I have like Wikipedia open over the weekend, be like, okay, how do you actually be an alderman? What's an alderman? Like, try and actually have them have a legitimate election process? It's just like a month in game, like four sessions of just, how do you become the mayor of this small town? I the only thing I know about Aldermans is that's what Obama was before he became like a, a president or senators. Like he used to be an alderman, and I'm like, okay, cool. I don't know what the fuck that is. The only no. thing I know about Alderman is from uh, if you've seen Epis for Family, uh, it's basically like a small town mayor or like like a half of a mayor. It's <laughs> mayor effectively Trump. like a mayor equivalent to being a senator. It's like yeah, it's that level of like. <laughs> We're one of the main people on the board to decide things the city does. Wow, I, I live in small town, like, backwoods, uh, Maine, so, like, I, I don't know shit about uh, city life. Like, I don't know shit about fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used apart. to live in Saskatchewan, the geographic middle of nowhere. Um, if oh, I remember correctly, I think that's uh, where Total Drama Island takes place. Oh my god, it is, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I fucking love Total Drama Island. If you like Total Amazing. Drama Island, we'll give a good rating. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's where about is. Just simple, easy to play games for now while we work on something needlessly elaborate in the background. It's just kind of getting our name out there. Mm. That's why yes. literally all of our products, products are pay what you want. It's like, yeah, you want to download and play a modified chess game? Go for it. We literally made... It's a one-sheet game called The Ultimate Showdown. It's our newest one we just launched. Mm-hmm. And what we did is, you know that game you play of who would beat who, but the restrictions are you have to pick a character from a different franchise? Right. Yeah. a scoring system for that. So how it works is you get one star if the character just win, but the fight's not interesting. Mm-hmm. You get two stars if the character would win and it's a good fight. 
you get three stars if it's a mathematically perfect counter that's truly beautiful. Kind of mm. like if it's like, well, I'm going to send Lex Luthor and someone's like, well, I counter a Phoenix Right Ace Eternity. Perfect mm. counter. <laughs> Lex Luthor right. has no recourse in that scenario. I agree. You know I agree. So Damn. like our game is just literally a piece of paper with a score sheet for you to just play this word game. And uh, I, <laughs> I love it. Death battle. Take notes. This guy's cooking <laughs> over here. Yeah, honestly, what the heck? Come on, Death Battle. Ah, shit. You ever see Death Battle? It's like, uh, they'll throw out character matchups, and it's just like, who asked? First (laughs) off, not even a balanced (laughs) fight. Who asked for this? It was me who asked every time. You're like, who who wants Majin Buu to fight Kirby? That was me. I'm the one person who asked for that. That that one was pretty cool. (laughs) Well, some of the matchups are just like, no, no, this isn't even close, and no, like yeah, anytime they sure. have Ben Ten matched up with anybody, it's just like, w- why, why? <laughs> He's got don't understand. He's just... he, can pr- he presses a button and becomes God. Your your argument's <laughs> invalid. Oh, but yeah, like playing this little ultimate showdown game. We've definitely um, had some like fun matchups that really hurt ben your 10. brain. It's like yeah. This per- Ben 10, literal god. It's like, yeah, here's my obscure anime characters whose left hand negates supernatural bullshit. Perfect counter, got you. Got him. I love Ben 10. And then you send in Mr. Rogers because he beats everyone every time. Oh, who's going to beat Mr. Rogers? Yeah, he just wins. What are you just <laughs> guy? He's just too wholesome. Although, He's just I'm a, a big guy. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of the Mr. Rogers uh, theory that, like, there was a rumor that went around years ago that he used to be like a. a mer- a sniper in the Marines, and just the the mental image of that. him on a on a battlefield uh, singing to himself like, uh, "It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood." <laughs> Takes a shot. <laughs> beautiful day for a neighbor. Hello there, neighbor. <laughs> Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Sights him in. Hello, neighbor. <laughs> Boom. Amazing. I mean, head blown. I off. mean, if you can. If you count Bob Ross as one of those wholesome types, then that is I mean, actually the case. Yeah, he, he yes. did do that. Yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> He's that guy. <laughs> uh, Bob Ross is like the uh, real life version of uh, the uh, dad in uh, fucking uh, Vinland Saga. <laughs> yeah yeah real life warrior uh tearing shit up but by the end of it he's just peaceful he's like i have no enemies look at these happy little trees <laughs> he's just vibing man <laughs> exactly man uh on my to-do list has been running the full-on pirate campaign like this just has kind of like been sitting there as like my opus maxis of dming that'll happen someday but you just need mm. the right crew Mm, I, feel I am feel gung-ho i love that kind of stuff because you know I, major one piece a fan right here i i once made a campaign setting that was loosely based on some of the concepts that one piece touched on and world building wise but in but instead of like a grand line like the the uh, entire planet is kind of a uh, form to be almost donut like where there's a uh area that goes straight through the center of the earth and because of gravity being all weird and stuff it it is effectively like a a donut and it's like okay all kinds of weird cosmic uh, bullshit happens here portals uh unstable weather uh different dimensions all uh crossing in and out so like anywhere from the plains or the nine hells like uh, each island will be connected to like a different location Mm -hmm. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, it was kind awesome. of funny. So to like hyper last little shadow dark thing. See, no, mm-hmm. a lot of times there'll be cool race ideas, cool functions, but they won't realize that that's like the actual theme of the character. So we made werewolves a class and we made vampires a class and we made mm-hmm. a a class because a lot of times people don't want this as like a side thing. I know this is kind of a joke. The old elf mm. is the class. Mm-hmm. But I find that if you let players have like the exact thing they want, they're over the moon. So oh, like, absolutely. Instead of like, oh, I'm a rogue swashbutter. Like, part of me is like, can I just be, let you be a pirate? Here is your class pirate. I have homebrewed you a pirate because pirate is clearly mm-hmm. what you want to be this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And honestly, like if, if someone, if you think about it with vampirism and uh, lycanthropy, it's one of those things where if you learn to master it, then it gets better. But if you don't, then you're just not going to be all that powerful, objectively. Yeah, I mean, in the uh, in the Grim Hollows books, 
those kind of things are treated as a transformation class. So they're kind of a, an addition to your class, you know, with their own kind of features and RPG elements. And, yeah, there's like tiers of uh, as that grows and develops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you, Ezra has the primordial one. Uh, our druid has the fey. Yeah, pretty interesting. I do have to ask, what is the like largest consecutive campaign you've ran? Level what to what successfully? So currently I'm running our ongoing campaign, our Grim Hollows. Uh, they started at, what was it, level three, I believe? Um, yeah. They're about level six or seven now. I, I think we're level eight right now. And Are you? I don't remember. It, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since we had a session yeah for, for me the highest level i brought my party up to personally was uh about level eight from level one mm -hmm. and that campaign took about a year yeah you know, we're like, getting into the six months range of this campaign i believe yeah i've only ever successfully done the one to 20 once it was a four-year ordeal oh wow, that's impressive last our last session, because we're like, this is probably going to be the last one. We actually like oh, booked a uh, back yeah. room in a nice bar because we knew we'd be Ooh. there all day. So we like booked their party room and mm -hmm. just ran D and D in this bar from twelve to midnight. That's amazing. That's only time I've ever cool. actually finished the campaign, and like oh. I literally wrote up little prologues for each character because I knew they'd succeed except one of them who did not make it. But no one really liked Keith anyway. Yeah, exactly. fuck you, Keith. You know, this one character they deliberately made, and they've worked their way into one of my novels I've written as well because I just enjoyed this character so much. Where their entire thing is, I'm rich and I'm funding the party. They're a bard, <laughs> and they never made a single attack from level one to twenty. All they did was say their bardic inspiration, which was, "Hey, if you do this, you're going to be looking at a bonus. Hey, if you keep impressing us like that, you might get a promotion." And that's all they did <laughs> was they were the team manager. <laughs> That sounds like some acquisition stuff, and uh, if you uh, really like that kind of thing, I highly recommend checking out the source book for it, because they have uh, these jobs that are kind of like roles to go, that go on in the background that offer bonus proficiencies, and uh, like as you progress throughout the game, you eventually get different tiers and ranks and more uh, special abilities that come out of it. It's like, uh, say you're uh, the... Uh, a cartographer. It's like, okay, cool. You get some map-based abilities and some uh, navigation skills. Or, like, say you're, like, a documenter. Okay, you're, you're documenting things. So you get a couple extra proficiencies and uh, some tools and stuff. And the, the special abilities that come with it are, like, they're minor, but they s still have impact on the game. Mm. But yeah, this particular party... So the party was nearly unkillable. They were a cleric, a paladin, a druid, but the three players between them had two doctorates. Like these are my most clever group of players I've ever had. <laughs> and oh boy. at one point they were able to like, they were on a boat that was invisible in the middle of the ocean to hide from a dragon. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. no, I get to make a perception check with this dra ancient dragon every hour. And the dragon looked for them for two weeks before giving up. Because mm -hmm. they're like, <laughs> the crew that's like invisibility, pass without a trace, put up a smoke screen, hide in the Arctic. Right. But the best trap I've ever laid for any players was what I called the library of everything you've asked me this campaign. So they broke into the enemy stronghold. It was a library. Amazing. And all I did was tell them it'll take you an hour, but you can answer a question. And three days had passed and the enemy had burned down their hometown because they just kept asking me information. I'd give them the honest answer because they'd find yeah. it in the records. And That's the entire awesome. trap was it was a library and they'd kill time there. That was it. Mm -hmm. Is I will <laughs> answer every question you've had right. and it will eat up your clock. It was the trap in its like entire yeah, perfectly. Uh, I'm going to write that down real quick. <laughs> yeah, I, may, I may yoink that. <laughs> Be taking notes in the corner. Uh, that, that's really good. I like that. Like, uh, I've put together some traps before. Nowhere near as clever as that, I'm ashamed to say. But at the same time, when you're trying to outsmart people with doctorates, sometimes too much information is the way to do it. Uh, they were the best to mess with because you could just do something simple. Like, oh, there's a spider on the ceiling. And then they killed that spider. And then the spider's lawyers came for them. Like it was whole like thing. Like I'd have to like they clear <laughs> the audience trap and then fall for the larger next level. I had to triple tra trap these people to get them. Mm -hmm. Like my dropping groups, there's a hole in the wall of spikes. Problem solved. 
for this group, it has to be a hole in a wall with spikes, and the spike has to be the key, and the key has to open the candelabra, only for that to be a diversion while the other attack is happening. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds like he took a page out of the art of war, and I, I would say that's kind of the unsung <laughs> oh. hero of D&D source books in general. What a good segue. You could talk about your art of war. Well, Ryan, don't you have uh, something of an art of war in the works? Uh, yes, actually. There's a uh, a book that I've been working on, kind of an adaptation of the art of war, the gamer's art of war. Uh, currently, I'm only a few chapters in, but I'm sure you guys have played some games online. You're just like, wow, all, all these kids and teenagers, they're, they're all dumb as fuck. Not a tactic to be had between them. Yep. <laughs> You wonder uh, where all the brain cells went, and apparently well, it's to this art of gaming. <laughs> well, I, I'm attempting to rectify the situation with the art of war, uh, the gamer's art of war, uh, both as a book that I am I want to try to see if I can convince a uh, something like Scholastic or something, sneak it into book fairs, you know? <laughs> That's the way to do it. Man. Yeah. It's oh, all about that on-foot networking. Exactly. And uh, to cover all my bases, I'm going to be starting a little YouTube Shorts TikTok kind of series to cover all the points of uh, the art of war and how they apply to both D&D and gaming in general. So that, That's you know, awesome. while people are using TikTok and Shorts to kind of destroy some brain cells, maybe counteract just a, just a tiny bit of that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I love that. I mean, Hopefully it's a little more sophisticated than with my first book, where I would literally go into libraries and put copies on the shelf in the fancy section and just <laughs> kind of hope people would find it. Hey, that's a good idea. That, that's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, yeah. typically when I hear people taking books and putting them in the fantasy section, it's always some asshole thinking they're clever for putting the Bible there. And I'm just like, dude, <laughs> no one thinks you're funny. <laughs> like, I, I'm not a Christian. It's just like, I just... Why you gotta bash yeah, people, a, dude? It's like, come on, just leave it alone. No, I'm much more insidious with my marketing. Like for my first novel, I had t-shirts done up. I gave them away to people as a prize so they would see it. Yeah, that's what, we, that's what we need to do for some uh, de- nerd militia. Yeah, because then people that's a a t-shirt is a conversation starter for mm-hmm. better or worse. I mean, I got a conversation starter of a shirt right here. People are like, hey, hey, I love your shirt. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I play D and D. Uh, and <laughs> you, you ever watch Stranger Things? <laughs> Oh, I I'm, just, a I'm just wearing a. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this one. I don't. I am Ancient culturally illiterate. <laughs> Magus Bride, man, come on. <laughs> oh no, I've literally been at tables being like, "Have you heard of Dungeons and Dragons? You know the game from Stranger." Th- I've given that. Uh, like, last uh, week, I was giving uh, that speech <laughs> to college students that walked by. Come join the RPG club. We you know, you know the game from Stranger Things. Speaking of things that are uh, vaguely D and D related bit of a segue here don't we have some uh, magic the gathering news <laughs> oh yes uh there is a uh, this is something very near and dear to our hearts uh that uh, kind of <laughs> popped up in the news recently uh very relevant due to yeah, we had yeah. a player death in our uh <laughs> current campaign it was due in our to, second it, session i believe uh it was like the third i think and so, yeah, one of our players died to a Goose Hydra. Okay, so let me let me explain a little bit. So there was they were in kind of this uh you know, kind of a soft forest, you know. They're walking through along this river. There's like this path that kind of bridged off into like this alcove. They kind of peek over, you know, our roguish um what was it, tabaxi, I believe? Our roguish tabaxi yeah, yeah. kind of skirts around so it does you know scout out the area. He gets full eyes on this four-headed Hydra goose. <laughs> He's like, I could take this thing. <laughs> well, uh, he, he could not. <laughs> a- after his tragic death to the multi-attack of a vicious goose, uh, apparently Double there's going to be a... I- I'm going to pretend that they're commemorating his uh, death with, yeah, our, yeah. with a five-headed uh, Hydra goose thing coming out as a card for magic, so... But uh, in the, uh, n- I think next year. Uh, okay, so it's, oh, more like planned for later this year. But, Rest in peace, Percival. <laughs> yeah, so they're going to be doing a, a Hydra Goose in m- Magic for, oh, it's teased for 2024. Okay, 
Cool. Nice. Cool. That's nice. That's beautiful. You know, the creature I used was from the Grim Hollows books called the Goose and it has a <laughs> has, you know the baby goose and it was just like the one or two heads and then, you know I did get to a max of five heads but I I even had them you know one head was like destroyed already <laughs> well, I, I guess the creature's crit, gaining man. traction <laughs> I like it I like it those things are terrifying wild hordes of them live in this region of Canada and be very mm-hmm. afraid they don't fear you they want to cause auto problems. Oh man, speaking of Canada, we have a little bit more news here. I don't know if you guys heard, but there is GameCon Canada coming. Uh, I would love some info on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it looks like it's coming from June 23rd to 25th to, what was it, August, I believe? All the way to August from June? It was like, like a whole summer convention? Yeah, that's what it looks like. How are you about to capitalize on like the entire uh, se- uh, season of not snow? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a little bit more news from the website here. GameCon Canada. This website's cool as hell, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All ages event, video games, board games, cosplay, esports, RPG programming, celebrities, toys, and much, much more. Oh, hey, that sounds like a promo. Oh, opportunity. this one ended already. I'm sorry. I'm talking what? about the one in 2024. <laughs> oh, so so the you know, next better luck year. next time. Like, it, yes, actually, yes. they they got some time to kind of build themselves up, get some notoriety, then like jump in on uh, next year's uh, Canada Game Con. Oh. Yeah, it does look like um, if you go to the website now, you can stay tuned for the next month where they'll be releasing the dates for next year. Ooh. Oh, hey, that's where it's at right there. You can scan the QR code, so it looks like uh, get the GCC app. So stay tuned. Yeah, nice. send them a link for that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, we pretty much go where invited and sometimes not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're planning to hit up some conventions at some point and just start podcasting live from the convention floor. How cool would that be? That's the way it's done. Exactly. Just be like, you, sir, uh, in the mm-hmm. in the strange costume I cannot place. Would you like to be a guest? <laughs> We gotta be strategic, big. Like, all right, we got Doom Guy and we got Isabel from Animal Crossing in our booth today. Ah, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Isabel, are you, are you and not a furry? <laughs> <laughs> I am not. Not for this paycheck. <laughs> we have our love for furries. Our uh, our editor is a furry. <laughs> uh, we we got a lot of furries on the server. Actually, love you, it, it, it's one of those things where you you wouldn't expect it, but like. There's, there's just, just a lot of them. <laughs> it's a big community. It really kind of is. related, but not really. Like when we went to run our My Little Pony adventure, I need to get like a friend of mine who was a lore expert to explain it to me, because I'd only heard seen bits and pieces and gifts. I'm like, okay, I need you to correct me when I get the terminology wrong, because people will fight you over that. Yeah, they will. Oh, they they will. <laughs> like uh, it's one of those things where when it comes to that kind of stuff, people get extremely lexical. Like every lexical rule lawyer type that uh, will just like burst through the wall like the fucking Kool Aid Man. Like, well, actually, this is how it's done, and this is how it's said, and you got this wrong because this is actually correct. I can't wait to get um actually on our shorts. <laughs> we were so confident about being um actually during our like rule explanation. We said each um actually is one point of psychic damage. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> so it was literally take a point of psychic damage for trying to correct the timeline. That's brilliant. Feel it. Feel it. The universe has an auto correcting algorithm. <laughs> uh, balanced as all things should be. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. I agree. Right. Reaching I the peak right there. We're looking at our time here. I think now would be because I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with our. Oh, you could uh, come back in with our monster for the week, Sam. Absolutely. Yeah. So usually for our break, we just like go and take a, a moment drink, to hit the bathroom, okay. refill your drink or whatever. Then well, we get Are right we back no to it. longer alive at this moment. Uh, just for the just for the moment, yeah. Oh, how did we do on the first half? Because I'm not sure how much chiming in we're supposed to be doing during your new segments and things. Really good! <laughs> Aye, works for me. Y'all are doing amazing. <laughs> mm. 
I'll be right back and we'll get started again. I almost had the opportunity to tell my favorite moment where we had to tell our group of serious players, grow the fuck up, we're playing ponies, okay? I think you'll get a chance to say that. Or I'll get a chance to say that. One of us will get a chance I'll to say that. I'll let you have it this time, because it's just so funny that it's like, <laughs> can I use my telekinesis to pull the blood out of their body? Grow the fuck up, we're playing ponies. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, so true, though. Uh... I love players that try to man max a game that they've never read before. Can we really have two friendship class characters? That could be a problem. <laughs> Fuck you! Friendship is magic! <laughs> oh, we literally had a player be like, um, we have two friendship aligned people and not enough harmony aligned people, so we should probably reclass. And it's <laughs> so much funnier because he had never read the book before and. <laughs> Uh, and imagine trying to min-max the pony game. It's just like, come on, guys, guys. It's, it's yeah. ponies. <laughs> just uh, roll I, like, with it. Like I was saying, one of my favorite things I think I've ever said during a game. So one of my players is like, it says I have telekinesis. Can I rip the blood out of their body? I'm like, grow the fuck up. We're playing ponies, okay? Make it <laughs> PG-12. Be a goddamn adult. And first off, like the amount of force it would take to do that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Like, but it's just like, where's your brain at when that's your first thought? I mean, like, you guys are aware, I, I really don't want to say a player died during today's session, right? That's not yeah. what I want for me or the world. Not to mention, like, there's um, so many physics uh, things that would come into play in such a situation. It's like, okay, sure, you're, you're trying to rip all the blood out of their body, but you have to create an incredible amount of, uh, let's say, like, a, a vacuum of force to just kind of do that. Like, uh, how? That that is like, not even the most ridiculous, like, physics-related feat this person tried to do. Okay, so, another game, it was the Magical Girl game. This guy tried to use his powers to shift the tectonic plates and cause an earthquake. <laughs> it's just like, I excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Ready to get back into it, Sam? Here. How's okay. this lighting? Look a lot better? It looks good, man. All right, cool. I put a lamp on my table. <laughs> All right, and we are back, good to go. Them. And you ready for uh, the monster see. of the week? Uh, you know, we kind of missed out on last week's monster. Kind of uh, got too <laughs> entrenched in the conversation. Yes, yeah, sorry to people who uh, maybe missed out on that one, but I promise there's a lot to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is kind of a, a deep, deep favorite of D and D. You know, a staple of the franchise. If, even is... if you haven't fought one, I'm sure you've seen or heard of a beholder. But these big bad eye guys have a lot to to say and a lot to do. <laughs> they are classic. They are. They're pretty classic. Were you gonna say something there for me? No, I'm good. I will happily no? point out oh, that. Yeah, go for it. I'm currently up to three for three for campaigns of Xanathar throwing, showing up. It is oh, one yeah. of my running jokes that nice. they'll find actual name brand Xanathar and Xanathar will say in character, How have you not heard of me? <laughs> I'm on the cover of Volo's book. I posed for three hours. I'm the monster. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I'm going ho for this. Canon Xanathar so shall, for, my Canon Xanathar shall forever be like that. Just the same as like when I uh, ripped off uh, Omen Drawn from the Ack Inc. because like he was supposed to be the boss for that campaign. I gave him uh, the uh, the pa the biggest Patrick Warburton impression I had, just like a with an extra bit of asshole to it. It's like, right? <laughs> so listen up, we you're gonna come in, and uh, we're gonna have a brunch. Now at this brunch, I will give you your rewards for all your hard work. But uh, here here's the deal. It's uh, kind of an early bird special, but I, I'm not going to be bang for the brunch. That's, that's out of pocket. That's out of pocket for you. <laughs> <laughs> There's like uh, a voices. 
<laughs> one of my favorite encounters. I, I, I was running D and D for a couple of new players, mm. and a beholder was thrown in, which was kind of silly because these were like level two players. <laughs> and then one of these players, they look up, see this gigantic creature, and it's like, "Oh, it's Mike Wazowski. I didn't know he was a boss." <laughs> <laughs> This is mockery. <laughs> Roll D one hundred. I oh. oh, I always love my Xanathar because he uses his insanity to break the fourth wall. He's like, you do realize you're all just figurines being looked above from gods that don't care, right? They spent hours dry rushing you to come to me and die. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> his Xanathar just keeps getting better and better. He <laughs> a big. Oh man, this gives like a really great, I think, aesthetic for what a beholder is and can do. Uh, well, I, the I worst love part it. is, so I made a poor life decision with Xanathar. Mm. So I bought Tales from the Yawning Portal, a bunch of D and D plug and play adventures. I was new to fifth right. edition. I opened the Doom Vault. I didn't realize the Doom Vault had a hundred rooms. But they were in the Doom Vault for about a year in real time. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay, wow. I need to replace the actual enemy here with someone interesting. So I'm like, yeah, multi-page boss battle. First, they fight Xanathar. Then he's going to turn into a death tyrant after he's defeated. And I like this, like, nice. elaborate seven-stage battle, <laughs> boss battle prepared. Because they've been dungeoning for, like, a real-world year at this point. Mm-hmm. At one point, one of them literally <laughs> drilled into the ceiling for natural light. So they polymorph him. <laughs> And turn him into a goldfish and throw him into a bag of folding. Oh shit! <laughs> Zanathar it, becomes the, the fish he cares for. Get wrecked. <laughs> so, about a year later, real time, they're like, "Oh, I reach the bag of holding. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work?" They flip it upside down. So, if something is too big for the bag of holding inside it, like a goldfish suffocating mm. and turning back into a beholder, it rips into the astral sea. So yeah. then they just knew that somewhere out there was the single most irritated beholder of all time who had one goal mm-hmm. to find them and ruin their lives. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Xanathar was also the beholder that uh, ran like that thieves guild. Right? Yep, yep. The, the Xanathar guild. Uh, that's the one. Yeah. That is that how they sense. ended up in that dungeon is they were just trying to get mm. their wallet back that was stolen by a Kenku pickpocket on mission one. Right, right. That, that's yeah, brilliant. I remember I was uh, when I was looking through the you know beholder stuff. There's a few notable ones, you know Xanathar, of course, and then there's the uh, Xanathar Rusakai or whatever, uh, the Eye who claimed to you know identify Xanathar in the 14th century. Sounded kind of crazy. There's a bunch of different, what looks to be variations of Xanathar too. I think one of my personal favorite is the third time I brought in Xanathar, because once in a while I just bring in Xanathar for the meme at this point. He had given his goldfish a super elaborate artificer body, like a full on mech <laughs> with a goldfish on top oh, of it. Oh, like full like mega mind. Like I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was like the powdered armor of Itoke or something. It was like a cannon object. It was like a legendary powered And it's I awesome. put the goldfish in it. One of the party members just lifted the lid off the bowl and cast destroy water. Damn. Damn. If it works, it works. <laughs> Damn. Um, right. that, that is I'll unreal. Go ahead and, okay, I guess I'll go ahead and get into the stuff. I'm glad you guys know your stuff. You can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, Beholder, sometimes called the Sphere of Many Eyes or an Eye Tyrant, was a large aberration normally found in the Underdark. These large or shaped beings had ten eye stalks and one central eye, each containing powerful magic. Powerful and intelligent, Beholders were among the greatest threats to the world. Boulder, oh, sorry, Beholders were immediately identifiable, being essentially a floating head with one single cyclops-like eye, surrounded by ten smaller eye stalks. Other than this, the main feature of Beholders' anatomy was the massive gaping maw. Because of these features, Beholders were occasionally known as spheres of many eyes, or eye tyrants, like I said, although the latter also referred to a specific type of Beholder. <laughs> and the eye tyrants are... Kind of one of the fun ones, I think. <laughs> Damn, there's so just crazy. so much that happens with beholders. Because, like, if a be- mm-hmm. if a beholder has a dream, like it manifests, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like a it can make other beholders and subsets mm-hmm. thereof, and that's just wild. Yeah, they have like the true power of just like magical creation, just fucking horrifying. <laughs> like reality I- manipulating. Go ahead. 
and one of my favorite things about beholders is they believe themselves to be the most perfect beholder mm -hmm. to ever behold. So like they'll manifest another beholder and hate them. Yeah. Like, <laughs> one of my favorite moments is they tried to like they tried to they made a parade float of Xanathar. And Xanathar had a night terror about this parade float, which created a bunch of parade float beholders. <laughs> that when they broke them open, they broke into thousands of tiny beholders like in Betty. Oh, oh my god. Oh damn, that that's something else right there. That kind of reminds me of an idea that I had for like a big bad uh, a beholder thing that was supposed to be derived from Xanathar. I, I, I never got a chance to implement it, but the idea mm. is like a, Xanathar one night has a dream and in this dream he dreams that he is a lesbian which uh is absurd because beholders don't have genders they they are asexual They're, there's just beholder they don't even reproduce in that way so <laughs> yeah. like it, it, this turns in this creates thusly a lesbian version of xanathar which be since beholders don't procreate in that way and they don't really have genders this creates a, a an existential crisis for the new beholder, <laughs> and as a as a, a way of taking out its rage on the world, because it'll never be able to uh, indulge in its lesbian beholder uh, drive and desire. It its goal is to erase all uh, all gender, all sex, all orientation from the entire world. It's like if it can't have what it wants, nobody can. Yeah, oh, yeah, go off, Queen. <laughs> Actually, something similar happened. So there's a beholder named Delilah Deathray because Ooh. they tried to like char. I can't remember the full thing, but there was a cleric of love that went around and effectively tried to defeat enemies via makeovers and divine interventions. Weirdly, right, right. consistently, like they'd rolled a successful divine intervention over that campaign seven times. And it was always for a makeover, never for anything <laughs> practical or useful. The so they're like, how about we give you a makeover? And then after they did, they uh, Xanathar dreamed in the female Xanathar, which was based on a thing from their Dungeon Mayhem card game of Delilah Deathray that just shoots charm rays at people and does nothing else. And all it does is ship people and leave. So oh just God. Charm rays at two party members and leave. And that was its one objective, was to pair characters together then leave. It's like Cupid, but holders. Yeah, it's <laughs> deeply horrifying. It, it is. I, I like that. And I find it <laughs> hilarious that anything s remotely similar to what I just described is uh, <laughs> popping into other people's heads. <laughs> yeah, man, you're not too too degenerated. Yeah, you got this. Uh, I, you I guess I'm not the only one. <laughs> uh, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to give a monologue about the Beholder Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe we can wait on that a little. <laughs> All right, hold that thought. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, we can talk about that when I go into the uh, the sub races, the whole the canyon, all kind of shit. Wow, there's so many. So going back into the you know, bit of a description here, beholders of the realms tend to be slightly larger than beholders found on other worlds, growing up to six feet in diameter, where on other worlds they would have averaged around five feet wide. The majority of beholders living on Faerun had skin colored in cool colors, purples and blues, on top of their bodies that graduated into earth tones further down. Said skin had a prebly texture. Uh, most of Toro's beholders had nostrils and jointed articulated eye stalks. Because of their entire body was covered in eyes, beholders had the capacity to see in all directions at once, making it nearly impossible to ambush them while also giving them an unusually high degree of perceptive ability. Although beholders lacked the capacity to see color, didn't know that, they had the ability to perceive even in the most darkened environment, under conditions in which a human or similar creature would be rendered blind. Beholders were also capable of flight, in spite of their lack of wings or similar physical features, simply hovering above the ground effortless. Effortless. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, yeah, this kind of wraps up the description of what a beholder looks like and what they can do for the basic portion of their physiology. <laughs> Though I do wonder if they hover via magic or if they have kind of a propulsion. <laughs> kind of like a like a flump, you know? Oh, like they're <laughs> just floating on beholder on farts? Yeah, yeah, beholder fart. So I did have to make a ruling about that one. So they're fighting a beholder, yeah. and one of the party members is like, if I hold up a giant mirror and he looks at himself, does he fall to the ground? 
So I, like I rolled Jess. Funny. <laughs> I, I love the idea that he looked at his own reflection, reflected an anti-magic at himself, and fell and hit the ground. Yeah. I don't think it's the canon lore reason, but that no. was the ruling he made at the time because it yeah. was funny and I got to do a lot of bludgeoning damage to that player <laughs> who was standing directly below the beholder. I kind of imagine that they, <laughs> they hover or they float just because like they both think they're like above touching the ground. And like, yeah, yeah. Because like their reality manipulation, you know, they simply just. They just exist. You know what I mean? So, like, why would they need to walk or be on the ground? My headcanon for it is that they just don't observe uh, gravity. Yeah. Like, why would they really <laughs> need to? You're like, yeah. It's just like, and I mean, for the sake of their maneuverability, it just seems like, you know, functional to float. <laughs> but mm. imagine if beholders like rolled on the ground. <laughs> 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 They just mean those be those rolly boys. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> Locomotion. Woo! <laughs> so, getting into the Forgotten Realms, ecology, and lore of these creatures. Uh, xenophobic and vicious creatures, beholders were quick to attack enemies, including anyone they deemed <laughs> not like themselves. <laughs> so, so far to say, the beholders were very, very racist. Uh, beholders, as a rule, were violent and greedy, <laughs> hungering for both wealth and power. Also, mm. capitalists. <laughs> I'd say that uh, it's not that they're racist. Like they're xenophobic in the yeah, actual yeah. sense of xenophobic. Yes. Like they they are legitimately afraid of everything and anyone that could possibly hurt them. Yeah, they they're like the the sterile freaks to the highest degree. Like, yeah, they're like, no, no, I I cannot be in the same room as another beholder. That's too much of a risk, buddy. Yeah. They don't even want to be on the same plane as another beholder. <laughs> oh, dude, I'd feel so dirty as a beholder, and if I had to share the same realm uh, with another beholder, like I'd have yeah. to wash myself every day. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if, like, they would just simply like seek each other out, you know, you know <laughs> and just to make sure that there's no uh, no one else that could, you know, fuck with their existence. Like, I, yeah. I gotta kill the competition. Exactly right. I mean, they think they're better than every other beholder. So, uh, yeah, they're they're known for their paranoia, and I think the paranoia is something to have a lot of fun playing with as a DM for sure. Yeah, definitely. Oh, for sure. Like, so for Chekhov's beholder. So mm. last time I had mentioned Xanathar, they threw him in a goldfish, and then the bag of holding, <laughs> the bottom of it broke out, and somewhere in space is Xanathar. And that mm. same bag of beholding was a ancient dragon they turned into a goldfish along with a couple other horrifying things they turned into goldfish. <laughs> well, so, well, I sense a theme here. So it seems like a strat. Go, <laughs> it's kind of amazing, though, because they finally foolishly go to the Astral Sea. This took me three years at this point, but they're mm. at the Astral Sea where I need them to be. They look in the distance and they see what looks like a dragon approaching until they realize <laughs> that the end of its neck is a beholder's eye, thousands of teeth and wings covered in hundreds of eyes. Xanathar had built himself a new body out of all the things they had killed and thrown oh into the astral sea. I love it. Jesus it's, Christ. <laughs> we've come full circle to the start of the podcast where it's like Krang from the fucking uh, Ninja Turtles. He built oh himself a new God. body. <laughs> like, I got called out on that instantly. It's like, does he think he's the most perfect and in character? I'm like, you taught him the lesson that he could be better. So he started making himself better. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, what do you get when you have someone who like already thinks you're the perfect being finding ways to improve that perfect? You know, you uh, this is a perfect cell situation where he's like, I'm yeah. a perfect being. And and then they're like, then uh, oh no, you ain't. Ah, oh, I could be perfecter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. this guy, perfect or sell <laughs> <laughs> right so like i mentioned earlier uh this was all this was made all the more complicated since more than one variety of beholder existed each believing itself to be the pinnacle of bodily perfection and they viewed other beholders who differed from this image and even the most minute details as loathsome enemies and inferiors so like so the, the, the <laughs> modern uh, body positivity movement in, in, if it was yeah. a person yeah, so. <laughs> you got uh, you got ten pounds on me. You should die. <laughs> <laughs> you even lift, bro. <laughs> just get good, I guess. I, don't know. <laughs> I just picture like Sorry. those four hundred pound models. Like, <laughs> no, you may not like it, but this is what the peak physical appearance is right here. 
Sorry, I'm just built different. <laughs> I'm just picturing actual Xanathar using like a telekinesis and dumbbells lifting them for no purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I guess wool, As man. if it helps. But because of the <laughs> reality perceptions, like somehow he develops abs in his sleep. <laughs> Got mental abs. Holy shit. <laughs> Xanathar dreams of abs. <laughs> Oh, Xanathar God. walks down the catwalk. Woo! <laughs> it's like the mouth, and then just like underneath is just ab. <laughs> uh, that, that makes me think of this uh, web comic oh, I read years ago. It's called Spinneret, where like uh, it's supposed to be like a female version of Spider Man, except she's got actual like more arms as you a spider person should. And like she, right, right. Dur- during the first few days of her uh, getting her powers, she's like, "I got girl abs, girl abs. This is fucking awesome!" Hell yeah! <laughs> so something else I found out that was pretty interesting: beholder minds are divided into two separate entities. Each of these entities thought and acted on its own, even though it was bound to the same body as the other half of its mind. So, uh, if you need to kind of a visual for this, and you like Ben 10, think about like Alien X, you know, how he has like the two okay. minds that have to agree to do anything. It's kind of like that. Um, I mean, my first, my first thought goes to the, uh, that Bo Burnham thing, uh, the right brain and yeah. left brain. Uh, exactly like that. Yes. <laughs> so neither half of the beholder's mind trusted the other. So they hid a lot from each other, (laughs) creating a very paranoid relationship. Um, (laughs) How? (laughs) So, sane beholders were beholders whose minds were not divided, so to speak. They were still two entities within the beholder, who neither hid anything from the other, making a less paranoid behold. Uh, However, the persona of a sane beholder was just as likely to be considered insane by any non-beholder, obviously, because there were two entities within a single beholder. They basically had, like, BPD, or, like, men- multiple personalities, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the beholder should also always be addressed by its full name in the conversation with them, or they would perceive it as speaking to only one of them. Right. So if you want to, like, <laughs> you got to address both of them, or I guess you would, like, offend <laughs> the other. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> So, on the topic of beholders, have oh, either of you no. heard of Large Luigi? Uh, no, but I have heard of the beer holder. I am I'm curious on how this relates. <laughs> Please continue. So there is a beholder named Large Luigi, who's the only lawful good beholder because he realized the secret to happiness was bartending, and uses ah. all of his beholder mm. power to give people drinks. Love so you it. just go to a bar, and there's just a giant death beholder using all of his abilities... To serve alcohol. That is it. it. It's and yeah, I guess and that would be considered like a sane beholder, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, he's a <laughs> happy beholder. The secret is he's constantly intoxicated. Yeah. Like to anybody <laughs> else, he's still like what self-medicating. The fuck is wrong with this guy? <laughs> but if you think about it, like it's the perfect strat. Who's gonna kill the guy that's giving everybody booze? Yeah, he's chilling. He's vibing out, man. <laughs> yeah. Like the all the drunks in the bar, like the big time alcoholics, become your instant bodyguards. It's like, whoa, 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 hold the fuck up! Did you just try to slaughter the guy that's given us free fucking liquor? Mm-hmm. Uh, all of a sudden, by the entire bar, us. boom. Yeah. Like, I know at some point one of my players is going to ask to be a beholder. And that's going to be deeply satisfying because I'm going oh, to love no. them, and they're going to have to deal with the fact they have another character inside their body telling them to make poor decisions. Yeah. <laughs> you player. should have two Intrusive players thoughts, play the same up. character. Exactly. Oh my god! The business student and the art student should play the same beholder. Yes, oh, no. <laughs> their oh, thought no. processes are fundamentally <laughs> different. And I'd oh, like to. God. There's a guy. Uh, Oh, Digibro. I, I don't know what uh, Digi's going by now. I think they changed the name on their channel. But the uh, there was a thing proposed by uh, Digi at one point talking about the spectrum of uh, how brain how uh, people think. Where like on one axis you have linear thinking and lateral thinking, then on the other axis uh, lexical thinking and impressionistic thinking, mm-hmm. and it's just like. 
if you really look at the spectrum of all those different types of pairings and thought processes, it's like, okay, a artistic person might be more uh, lateral and impressionistic. Well, someone who's more business-like would be more lexical and linear thinking. So it's like, they can't even comprehend how the other person is able to think. So it's just like, mm. those juxtaposed forces would be so good for that. I agree. Indeed. See, I'm lucky. I'm on the exact middle of those thinking, and the only cost is my hands don't work correctly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I get math, and I get language, and I cannot hold a pencil. Perfect deal. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm definitely more on the uh, lateral uh, side of things, where it's just like, I, my entire thought press process is idea popcorn. Idea popcorn. Idea popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tell people, I don't choose what I work on. The ADHD does. So I do a lot of things, but I don't get to pick what they are. They get done <laughs> in 24 hours. They're impressive. I have no say over what gets done, though. I feel that so deeply. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> a fellow lateral thinker. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. But uh, let's see, rounding about the ecology and lore here. So beholders were often found occupying deep underground caverns. Frequently, these frequently these layers were carved out by the beholders themselves, using their eye rays to mold the environment for their purposes. Often, these layers were built vertically rather than horizontally, like most buildings. With beholder architecture frequently exhibiting a large number of vertical shafts, which beholders and other flying creatures could use with ease, while walking creatures found their navigation hindered. Beholders worshipped Zemnid and the Great Mother. So I did some a little they bit of research. They worship anything at all other than themselves <laughs> is surprising. Exactly, yeah. And I found it a little bit deeper and kind of found out what these things were. So uh, Zemnid was the beholder deity of obscurement and deception, and the son of the great beholder mother. He was the underdark god of gases and fogs, sometimes known <laughs> as the gas giant for his mastery of <laughs> elemental air spells and renowned for his evasive and elusive abilities. So this is the fart god. Basically, god yeah. Gases. yeah. Yep. <laughs> He's known as the gas giant, so big fart boy. <laughs> you know? Got him. And the, oh, uh, the great mother, sometimes specified as the great beholder mother, was the eldritch matron deity of the beholders. Her title sim simply referred to her role as their progenitor, rather than as an indicator of her questionable gender. Beholders themselves lacked a name for her and felt no need to give her. But, you know, that's kind of uh, fun. And, like, I do see parallels to, like, real-world, uh, like, religions, because there are uh, some uh, belief systems where it's just like, y you don't need a name for your god. Your, your god's the... It, it, the one that created shit. You, you're good good enough. Yeah. Here's the thing. It's like, what do you mean your god don't have a name? <laughs> I guess if you needed a name, the, the creator, but that's about it. Yeah. God's so powerful, you don't need to give it a name. It just yeah. is. Exactly. <laughs> when run D&D, &D, I love the dumber the god, the more likely I am to include them. Like Ratatoskr from yes. Norse mythology. The yes. God yes. <laughs> yes. That, that's it right there. <laughs> Like, when you roll a divine intervention, a deity comes down to help you, and it's a squirrel who's like, I can take a message anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> anywhere in the nine realms. <laughs> so I do plan to do uh, further episodes on each of the variants of the holder, but I'll give a short little name drop of each. So going to the sub-races here, we have the Blood Kiss. It is an undead beholder that sucked its prey dry of blood with its eye tentacles. You have the Death Tyrant. They were undead beholders that came to zombies. You have the Doom Sphere, a beholder that had died and risen as a ghost. Its eye stalk rays took on more chilling and necromantic properties. You have the Elder Orb. The beholders were born with more amazing longevity and near immortality. The Eye of Flame, an unusually docile form of beholder whose members, while still malevolent, were willing to serve beneath more powerful beholders. The Eye of Frost, a cool beholder who lived in solitude, uh, usually preferred the ice spells. Eye of Shadow, Lived in the shadow fell. You got the Hive Mothers, also known mm. as the Ultimate Tyrant, an enormously powerful variant of Beholder with the capacity to stun nearby enemies as well as greater range and eye ray abilities. Hive Mothers had the ability to magically dominate other Beholders. Mm. I, I think hey, my favorite thing mommy. about all of I think my favorite thing about all of this is that the mm -hmm. nature of when a Beholder has a dream and it can like create other mm -hmm. Beholders. Uh, yeah. It's always this like is what I'm going to talk to you a little bit. Yeah, because DMs is just like 
yeah, you got what you just listed, you, but you can really get creative. <laughs> you get you have to get creative as a DM. It's like uh, some uh, rules lawyer in the group might be like, it's not in the monster manual. It's like then you have to show hand them back their monster manual right here. This line right here says that beholders make other beholders based off wild fucking dreams yeah. that they have. Uh, guess what, bitch? Now you got a shark beholder. Get right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, another galaxy brain trap you and your listeners can steal. Yeah. So. If you have a dungeon of a beholder, give them a free sleep spell like a staff of sleep oh, yeah. or a ray mm. of sleep. Because if you can bait them into putting the beholder to sleep and have a second <laughs> beholder spawn on them, they customize the specifically. <laughs> oh it's my so god! It's so good that it worked. Holy mm. shit! Also, big bad idea. Everyone, please feel free to use this one. A yes. beholder who has uh, managed to work together with a mad mage that. Mm-hmm. Puts the beholder to sleep, and then uses uh, that. What I think it's either nightmare or dream. I forget the name of the spell, but there's a spell where you oh. can manipulate the dreams of your yeah. victim. And by manipulating the dream of a beholder, you thus have the ability <laughs> to create whatever the fuck you want. Oh shit! And as a so right. and as a big bad, that is devastating to your players, as you can create all these uh, different uh, red herrings for them to go after. Holy shit, you could create a legion of a beholder colony, all run by this one mage and this beholder, who have some kind of weird pact, I guess, or control domination. Oh, <laughs> here's, another, here's another idea. Uh, a beholder suffering from narcolepsy. Yes! <laughs> yes. One of the just eyes just sporadically cast the swoop spell. <laughs> oh my god. Getting into the uh, beholder kin a little bit, um, you have the death kiss, with the blood draining tentacles, you have the director, the beholder's hive, shock troopers, the eye of the deep, an aquatic species of uh, beholder. The most notable physical change was its two large clawed arms, which is really odd. Um, you have the goth of a subspecies of beholder from the same plane as spectators, which fed on magic and magic objects. You have the gazer, also known as the eyeball, a tiny beholder king with four eyes. The gouger, nice. a ruthless carvenor, the hunted beholders, savage. You have the observer, observer. An observer was one of the most socially adept of the Beholder family. So uh, most likely to maybe work with like a small city, you know, a deep dark mage, you know, a king or yeah, something. Yeah. You know, you got the overseer. An overseer resembled a large fleshy tree with mouse on its trunk and eyes <laughs> on its branches. Nope. <laughs> I hate it. It's, you got nature ones. Yeah. Every flavor. And then you got the spectator. Uh, the spectator was extra planar, extra planar beholder kid with four eyes. So, it's bouncing around the uh, multiverse, I suppose. And then last but not least, you have the beholder mages, or the beholder mage. A beholder who wished to learn the art of arcane spellcast. You know, outside of just their innate eye stalk ability, they kind of focus on wizardry, you know, and uh, <laughs> that's... <laughs> You got a well, beholder that becomes a wizard? Holy shit. <laughs> well, you know, ultimately at the end of day, the day, like uh, when it comes to beholders, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I haven't even gotten into their, uh, what these eye abilities are yet. You know? <laughs> at, it gets at this crazy, point, guys. <laughs> Beholders are a big mess of they, shit. They got everything. Like we all know, they got that that cone of anti magic. That's one of the the big yeah. things. This is the big eye, you know. Right, right. So I'll go over this pretty quick. Many, but not all, beholders also have the capacity to use their central eye to project the field of anti magic, like you said, which canceled the effect of all supernatural abilities within a small cone of 150 feet. Uh, in addition to any spells, prayers, or similar effects, this also affected a beholder's own eye rays, expressing their power. Uh, the inability to cast its eye rays at full strength was hardly a hindrance. It allowed a beholder to attack its foes with its large toothy maw. So, beholders often attacked for seemingly no reason, but often try to end a battle as quickly as possible, unleashing their terrifying abilities all at once. So, beholder had a challenge rating of 13, uh, 14 within their lair. Um, so, going over each of the eye rays, uh, First, you start with the Charm Ray. <laughs> the targeted creature must succeed on a DC 16 Wisdom save or be charmed by the Beholder for one hour. You have the Paralyzing Ray. 
succeeded on DC 16 Constitution saving throw, be paralyzed for one hour. You have the Fear Ray, DC 16 Wisdom save, or be frightened. Slowing Ray, DC 16 Dexterity save, or your speed is halved. In addition, the creature cannot take reactions, and it can take either an action or a bonus action on its turn, not both. <laughs> you have the Enervation Ray. The targeted creature must make the DC 16 Constitution saving throw. Or take 8d8 necrotic damage on a failed save, half as much on success. You have the telekinetic ray. If the creature mm. must succeed on DC 16 strength save, or the beholder moves it up to 30 feet in any direction, you are restrained by the telekinetic grip uh, until your next turn, or until the beholder is incapacitated. If the target is weighing more than 300 pounds or less, Blah, 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 it has moved up to 30 feet in direction. Yeah, so you could be lifted up and then just fucking focus blasted by all the <laughs> other rays. <laughs> yeah, th uh, that shit is brutal, dude. Like, yeah. there's a reason that they're so dangerous. And yeah. honestly, uh, their paranoia, if you uh, take any time to think, okay, what would this beholder be scared of as a DM? That's yeah. full reason to have them be even more dangerous like okay if they're scared of something enough they might have uh, yeah. a few magic items on hand and They'll some go. contingency plans yeah like full like unhinged no prejudice blow you up and i think you know getting into these last four uh, rays i think are the worst you know you have the sleep ray dc mm. 16 wisdom save or fall asleep for one minute um you have the petrification ray which is a dc 16 deck save on a fail, the creature begins to turn to stone and is in restrained. Must repeat the saving throw at the end of its next turn. On a success, the effect ends. On a failure, the creature is petrified until freed by the Greater Restoration spell or other magic. You have the Disintegration Ray. The creature must succeed on a DC 16 Dexterity saving throw or take 10 D8 Force damage. If this damage reduces the creature to zero, it body becomes a pile of fine gray dust. If the target is large or smaller, non-magical object or creation of magical force, it is disintegrated without a saving throw. If the target is a huge or larger object or creation of magical force, the right disintegrates a 10-foot cube of it. Damn. Wow. Holy. And last but not least, we have the death ray. Targeted creature must succeed on a DC 16 dex save or take 10d10 necrotic damage. If you are reduced to zero hit points, you die. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Wow, go directly to death. Do not pass go. Do not collect yep. $200. <laughs> yeah. Straight to hell, man. <laughs> Straight <laughs> to the no-no zone, man. And, you uh, know, you could brutal. really get creative and make the beholder kin of your eldritch abomination creation have variations of these rays. Mm, I'm a big fan of, like, going the Majin Buu route and just giving one mm -hmm. a candy ray. Like, yes. turn to chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a, uh, I don't know, give one like a doo doo ray, and boom, you gotta poop yourself now. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> no, Fail the okay. constitution check and just shit your pants. <laughs> Brutal. I That'd be extremely me. distracting. <laughs> a weirdly fun combo with a beholder is you turn one person to stone and telekinesis it around and just beat them with their friend. I had oh that, God, do that yeah. one time. I love it. I love it, I love it. He's like, if you kill me, your friend will fall to their doom and then just hit them with it. Yeah. <laughs> Beat a Friendship motherfucker with another motherfucker. Weapon. Classic. Uh, but that counts a magic weapon. <laughs> mm. Or the radioactive beam, which just gives them cancer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that scene from uh, that Harley Quinn show just where she, she just picks up a fucking cancer gun, shoots a guy, and, and he's like, wait, what, what What? What did you just do? It looks like, cancer gun? Who would make this? You just gave him Harley cancer. Quinn. <laughs> Harley Quinn, you just gave me cancer? I gotta go call my kids. <laughs> I gotta, fuck this shit. I gotta, I gotta go be with my family. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that God. seed was priceless and it's just oh. like in any other circumstance would have been perfectly fine getting fucking shot but the fact that you gave him cancer he's like oh, I'm living on borrowed time now <laughs> he's like just shoot me I guess like oh, oh it's funny uh, like 
one of the D and D books I have even has like a list of what you can spells you can swap rays out for. It's like if they think you know your beholder, use this list of options to make it worse. Like one's like an irresistible dance ray, which is hell just- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you just hear like phantom uh, hand claps <laughs> and he's just playing music <laughs> and it's like <"Oop-a!" laughs> sudden spotlights come out of nowhere <laughs> it's first a musical afraid, beholder <laughs> first they were afraid then they were petrified oh wow God. you really can turn a beholder yes. in ah <laughs> uh, damn I love it it does close up what I have for beholders today if you guys enjoyed or learned something, you know, a new way to fuck up your players, you have a ball. Uh, honestly, I cannot wait for the next time that I use a, a Beholder as a DM. Like, I was getting close to using it in the last campaign because the Xanathar Guild and a few other factions were all racing underneath the city of Waterdeep to get to a vault that had all the a, a bunch of stolen treasure. Mm. Like, I, I was ripping off a little bit of uh, the Dragon Heist stuff because one of my players got a, had heard about that. It's like, I was going to kind of segue into it in the campaign, but wouldn't you know it, someone got access to a wish spell and wished for all that gold, and then they had to, like, to bring it to the boss after destroying their ship with the shit ton of gold. <laughs> gold is what not light. What would happen if a beholder <laughs> it's like, got its hands on, like, a deck or many things? It would make someone else draw and then take the stuff. It's no <laughs> fun. Yeah. You know what? You're right. Which it's, it captures your party and forces them to draw from the deck. It's no like hands. it coerced Russian <laughs> roulette. Has no hands. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I can't use it because it technically I have no hands. Not even opposable yeah, thumbs. You even like watch it like cast mage hand and like try to pull a card. Like, oh. Uh, so there's one bit with my friend Xanathar where one of his eye stocks had a knife tied to it. So they're just fighting and just stab them. <laughs> and one of the players goes, Why do you have a knife? He goes, I saw thousands of timelines, millions of futures. He never saw this coming, did you? Did you know? Never thought I'd just stab you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving will, your Xanathar just... more and more, and I just I need this in my life now. This is amazing. I need a game with this in my world. Oh my goodness, just like, I will destroy you with all of the powers that are bestowed to me and this knife I found. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, what does the knife do? It stabs people. 1d6 of slashing damage, ooh! <laughs> I knew you would prepare, you had anti-magic armor, you had reflections and mirrors, smoke and invisibility. But were you prepared for my friend, Mr. <laughs> Stabby? <laughs> oh God, he pulls out lemon grab. <laughs> he pulls out lemon grab from one of our games. <laughs> uh, for clarification, uh, oh man, uh, he, what he's referring to is a rapier called Lemon Drop, which uh, Lemon Drop. There you go. Yeah, you see, Lemon Drop is a obnoxious magic item that's intelligent that I made years ago for a specific player. So and all, all it really does is it it's intelligent and extremely annoying. And uh, it secretes uh, lemon juice all up and down the blade. So what's worse than getting a cut? <laughs> getting lemon juice in the cut. You can also dip it in water to make lemonade. Yeah. That's amazing. And it can also do acid splash uh, as uh, its own attack. So it's like, okay, it it's good, but it's extremely annoying to the party. You basically have Excalibur with lim- lemon juice on it. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, hi guys! Master, I- I'm going to squirt lemon juice in his eye! <laughs> yeah, get him! <laughs> Master, why are you ignoring me? Uh, roll for patience. Bad magic items I've ever existed or things I've made up on the spot. Like I made two magic item shops one time. One I had prepared that was a respectable one, and one that was just a tarp out back. And from that one magic <laughs> shop, I had bought in the stilettos of haste, which were boots of haste, except you had to do an acrobatics check or you'd fall. Amazing. I love a it. A whip of healing, which was just did one d four healing damage. Amazing, and amazing. oh yeah, it was just a shock collar that just cast shocking grasp on yourself as the victim. I didn't know amazing. what they were going to do with it, but they had it. 
I, I hey, love that, and it's like, in the hands ideas. of players, you never know. I mean, I know a guy that I used to work with, he uh, came up with a magic item called the Wand of Wanding, in which, like, it creates copies and duplicates of itself that don't do anything, but if the original Wand of Wanding is destroyed, then uh, one of the copies or duplicates becomes the new original. That's amazing. <laughs> I don't know if this exists, but I had this idea for a crown of hindsight. With, um, it gives a bonus to your perception, but only after something has already happened. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, one of my personal favorites is I gave to Will here is he went to a shrine of good luck and rolled a natural one on perception check and found a lucky rabbit's foot. Oh, and then was stalked oh by a three legged rabbit for the rest of the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> It's just standing in the corner with a knife. <laughs> oh no, it didn't need a knife. That thing was an eldritch horror. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beholder that got polymorphed. <laughs> Damn, he, he's the uh, DM I didn't know I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. oh goodness. No offense to you, Sam. <laughs> nope, nope, it's fine, it's fine. I, I see where I'm lacking. <laughs> He, he just does oh, things that you don't. But uh, you know what? With all this homebrew, I think we should move on to our homebrew for the week. <laughs> all right, <laughs> Sam, do you want to start or should I, or should we roll for it? I think we can uh, have all my dice on hand. Oh, shit. Well, you know what? I got dice on hand because I'm oh, one prepared go. boy. Gosh. Give it he, <laughs> he found it. Maybe. It's like 10. It's like 20, it. If you want to always win the dice roll, don't put the person the size of the dice. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm rolling with the 100. <laughs> make it more oh, interesting. No. It just keeps going. That's not intentional. <laughs> it won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Orion, let's roll D100 to make it more interesting. Oh, percentile. Here we go. Yeah, I do have a percentile here. Well, you know, th these are right. metal dice, sir. 23. 10. <laughs> Boom. Okay, I guess I'll be uh, starting us off here. Uh, let's see... Uh, yours was that one, and I am bringing in this week the Half Giant Playable Race. Now, Half Giants were kind of a thing that I liked in 3rd uh, Edition, 3.5. Uh, you, you see them in other uh, games, like Pathfinder and shit, but in 5th Edition, they're just not really present. Except if you consider, like, uh, Goliath. So, I, I found this one. It's by uh, Dichotomy Games. You can check them out on Reddit. I'll leave a link in the description afterwards. And let's see. Uh, they got a bunch of uh, sub races, which is always cool. Uh, they got some flavor text here. Let me just uh, click on that. Get a little. Okay, in some cultures, half-giants are believed to possess magical abilities, such as the power to control elements or communicate with nature. This belief mm. has often been linked to their connection to their giant heritage, as giants are frequently associated with natural forces and primal energies. In other tales, half-giants are said to be born with powerful rage that can only be quelled through the intense physicality of combat. These stories are of uncontrollable anger often lead to a stigma for half-giants. They are often seen as a source of great danger for those around them, making it difficult for them to integrate into society or form meaningful relationships. Despite their reputation as fierce warriors, half-giants are very often peaceful, contemplative, and valuing introspection, self-reflection above all else. They may spend long oh, yeah. periods of time in isolation, meditating. Okay, okay, yeah, we get it. They're, they're a stoic bunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we understand. Yeah, it goes on to talk about half-giant names and uh, their dominant genetics. Like, I, I get it, motherfucker. I I've watched Harry Potter. I know what I know that Hagrid's a half-giant. Hagrid's a legend. He's not a stepdad. He's the dad that stepped up. 
Hey. He is. <laughs> like, dude, that's one of my biggest issues with a lot of uh, shows. Like, w- whether it's Harry Potter or Naruto, it's like, you got uh, the godparents that were supposed to be there, but, like, it wasn't enough for the uh, parents to be dead or gone or whatever. No, even the godparents weren't able to step the fuck up. Like, what's going on here? True. Very, very true. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. I, I, I swear most media just comes down to blame your parents because they weren't there and blame the godparents because uh, for whatever reason they weren't around. It's like, what's the point of godparents if they're not even around? So, Aren't the whole point of godparents to be parents when you're not there? Like when Exactly! It's like, hey, I designate, entire- like, if, if I fucking die, if I kick it, like, dude, you gotta step up and raise my kids. Like, uh, that that's the, you know, social contract right here of a godparent. But, you know, fuck that shit, I guess. So, looking yeah. at their uh, stuff, of course, they're going to get a plus two to their strength score. Nice. Uh, they mature quickly and often uh, within a decade and can live to be 100 years old on average. So... Half giants, truly living up to their name, are often seven to eight feet tall and weigh about as much as four hundred pounds. Your size is technically medium. Okay, powerful build. You count as one size larger in terms of carrying capacity. You can push, drag, and lift. A giant unchained. As an action, you can increase your size to large for one minute. Uh, you do not. If you do not have uh, room to increase your size, this trait has no effect. And you can use this trait once again and okay, once and regain the ability to do so when you complete a long rest. You can read and speak uh, common and giant, which uh, the language for that is uh, Yotun, I, I think. Mm-hmm. Tech- yep. And then we kind of get into their uh, sub races, which I, I think is cool that they got a bunch of sub races. We got Cyclops, Oni, Ooh. Troll, and Etten. Eaton? Ooh. Like the college? <laughs> I, hey, I wasn't expecting to hear Cyclops and Oni in there. That was a yeah. fun Because right? like, like Wizards of the Coast loves to be like fire, water, earth, air, and everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. So it's nice to see mm. it like go a little more diverse than that. Yeah, see. You know, that, I, I remember I like that. the first character I ever made was a Minotaur. And mm. you know, I remember like looking into wanting to make it Oni. And the DM saying, no, Oni's not really a thing. Oni's are so <laughs> cool. Like, <laughs> honestly, and this kind of fills that little slot. Like, mm. you're not, you're, you're half Oni and therefore half giant, which is like, okay, cool. I like that. Half Cyclops, you could straight have your, your Leela type character for a game, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, Futurama's <laughs> making a comeback. So, you know, shout out to that. Now's that the time. Tough. I have uh, seen the first episode of that. It is uh, worth watching. Awesome. I can't wait till I, you know, find the time to update my Hulu <laughs> subscription or whatever's uh, whatever it's on. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're starting out with Cyclops, which uh, an extra plus 1 to your strength score. So, if you choose Cyclops, that's a plus 3 out of the gate to your strength. Like holy Strong fucking boy. shit. It's very realistic to have a 20 strength out of the gate if you go with this, and that's just you know, wild. I remember when I was uh, making Titan, I was trying to think about you know what race to choose. Um, before I picked War Force, I thought about the half giant thing. They, mm. they didn't have these sub races. Now maybe I would have picked one of these. <laughs> right? This is where Homebrew uh, for, for comes reference, to play. Um, Titan was a War Forge monk that I ran in uh, one of Orion's campaigns. Oh, uh, that was, that was actually Quinn, the one that Donovan it was ran. Quinn's Donovan, right, right, right. Donovan. Yeah. So, digging more okay. into the Cyclops sub race, we got Cyclops Instincts. So you have athletics or intimidation as a proficiency. So you get to pick one of those. Mm-hmm. So if you really want to be the master grappler, take athletics and then like uh, get some of those extra feats, like a tavern yeah. brawler or the grappler feat. Oh yeah. Get that major grapple energy. Uh, poor depth perception. You have disadvantage on any range yes. attacks. <laughs> uh, Makes sense. Against a target greater than 30 feet away. <laughs> Who did this to you? Nobody did this to me. 
I'd imagine uh, disadvantage on like being blinded and stuff like that. Alright. Let's you know what that that would make sense. Then yeah. maybe they got hulking stance. You're not incapacitated and not prone. Uh, okay, while you're not incapacitated or prone, you have advantage on checks and saving throws against effects that would move you from your space or knock you prone. Okay, so you're not easy to knock down. Big boy. Then you got overbearing oh, yeah. presence that you can add your strength mod to your charisma for deception, intimidation, or persuasion checks. Ooh, I like that. Ooh, That's pretty... Nice. So, oh, yeah. I love when a class has a downside. Like, the old mm-hmm. cobalt that had minus two to strength mm. isn't... I get afflicted with mo- minus two strength. Is, I get to have minus two strength. Because I always find role-playing a flaw is such a good place to start a character. Like, mm. a Cyclops sniper would be a character I build on instinct because it's so funny to me. To be like, all right, I'm a ranger, I have a longbow, and I have no depth <laughs> perception, but I believe in myself strongly. <laughs> I love that, and it's one of those things where, uh, back when 1st Edition Pathfinder was very popular, uh, they were very known for having their quirks and stuff, where it's like, okay, there's drawbacks, so it's like, I can get like a little thing that's a little boost to one of my RP things, something very minor, and then I can just take it a bunch of drawbacks, so it's like, okay, I'm bad at a bunch of little things that have minor uh, repercussions mechanics-wise, but it's very flavorful. Okay, then moving on to the next uh, sub race, we got uh, Etten, Eaton, I can't read. Uh, your <laughs> wisdom score increases by one. Uh, you can get uh, Etten instincts, proficiency in investigation or perception. So that that's really nice. I, I wouldn't expect that, given uh, how Ettens are. Uh, Twin faces. Your wide head contains two entirely separate brains. Well, hey, that circles back to what we were talking about earlier. Each sporting its own uh, face. Each has its own distinct voice and personality and can take control of the other uh, is when the other is in a weakened state. Each of your faces is separately affected by certain conditions affecting your senses and mental state. When you're forced to make a saving throw against an effect that would subject you to blinded, charmed, deafened, frightened conditions, you can make uh, that saving throw twice instead of once. You're subjected to that condition only if both saving throws fail. (coughs) That's hilarious. And if you would make the saving throw with advantage or disadvantage, you apply both advantage and disadvantage to both of these rolls. (laughs) Uh, That'd be a fun one to have two yeah. players Jaeger pilot. Dude, that I like it because so many players are like, I want to be multiple personalities. And it's like, okay, well, what's what are we going to do mechanically here? This. This is what you're going to do mechanically. <coughs> two heads. Two faces. <laughs> Next we got Oni. Controller and want to eat pizza. It, it's brilliant. <laughs> So Oni Bloodline, you get a plus one to your charisma. You can choose between Arcana and Religion for your Oni instincts. Oni's Hands uh, gives you proficiency with the Glaive. Cool, cool. And then Hypnotic Haunters. You know the Friends Cantrip starting at third level. You know the Sleep Spell. And can cast it once uh, with this trait starting at fifth level. You know the Darkness Spell and can cast it once with this trait. Once you cast there... the sleep or darkness with this trait, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. You can also Are there cast... variations between the red and blue? Or is it just uh, based it, on... It's just one. Uh, unfortunately. You, you can also uh, cast either spells uh, using any spell slots you have of the appropriate level. Okay. Hey, bonus spells. And I think where it's like you got these options that's like, okay... Yeah. Red leaning, blue leaning, I guess. This sounds more like the caster version of the half giant. Yeah, and then uh, we kind of round things out with troll. So that that's cool. Constitution plus one uh, for the instincts. You can choose nature or survival. And emergency regeneration at the start of your turn. If you've taken damage since the end of your last turn, you can recover two HP. Uh, you do not uh, recover these uh, hit points if you are at zero hit points, 
or if you have uh, taken ast or fire damage since the end of your last uh, turn. The number of hit no, points I... you recover increases uh, to 3 at 6th level, 4 at 11th level, and 5 at 16. You know, I do like you know them putting the troll regeneration in there, though very, very lackluster. Though I guess you would have to balance that in some way. But I would rather it be mm. a good feature and then have like a pretty decent negative than it be like you heal two health. Like, <laughs> mm. well, it's one of those things where I'd say like a speed penalty or something. Uh, I I think it's one. Yeah, there should be like a maybe another downside here, but yeah, it, it, you can get around it. And the cool mm. thing is, like, it's a little bit of minor regeneration, so you don't see that too often. I mean, I, I would imagine you know, if I were to be like, oh man, I want to play a troll, you know, a main feature of a troll, you know, they're known for their regeneration. So mm. I would, it has to be a little bit more, you know, of a feature of that suburbs, I imagine. Because mm. then otherwise, why would you pick it? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> other than the flavor of you wanting to be a troll. Right? Yeah, I <laughs> mean, it, 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 like a jumping point too. Like, I find in 5e races, they're usually like a starting point. And then you can build the rest of your class build around. Like, say you made a troll barbarian. Mm. Yeah. Suddenly you have that extra durability, and all those hit points are now worth twice as much because you're taking half damage. It's true, or if you yeah. went like one of the, I think it's past of the beast can heal a bit. Or if you went like, oh, I'm a troll paladin, and I reflavor my flavor oh, and to more yeah. healing. You could try and like give that little extra boof to yourself. True, it's definitely true. Mm. And I could imagine, you know, in that sense, it goes a little crazy. You know, we're going to kill this player now. <laughs> I mean, I guess he would just throw a fire enemy, but like, you know, be hard. All right. So, Sam, you ready with uh, your magic thing yeah. for the week? Yes, yes, yes. I have brought in the bag of wonders randomization. <laughs> uh, this is brought to you from D&D Beyond. Um, let's see, who's the creator here? We wrote on this big table. The creator looks like Mehmet. <laughs> <laughs> Met, met. All right, so thank you to you for making this item seem pretty sick. So this is a wondrous, very rare item. This bag is an extremely flamboyant violent color, violet, violet color, with a golden question mark on one side, and feels as if it was made with the finest silk. The bag weighs five pounds. <laughs> it's a research bag. <laughs> so looking inside the bag reveals nothing. You see only an empty bag. Reaching inside the bag, you also feel nothing. But when you remove your hand from the bag, an object or creature randomly chosen from the table below is in your hand. In the case of a creature, the creature falls to the ground, prone and unaware of its surrounding. Placing an object in the bag results in the bag beginning to take, oh, beginning to shake violently and fall to the ground and spit the object back out. If another object or the same one is attempted to be placed in the bag a second time within the delay, within a 10 day, 10 day. A 10 day is a week in the more. Forgotten Realms. Oh, okay, okay. So if you put it in a second time within a 10 day, the bag shakes even more, hitting anyone within five feet of the bag for one D4 bludgeoning damage. And again, <laughs> that, the bag hilarious. spits the object out. He <laughs> slapped <laughs> from his bag. If another object, or the same one, is placed in the bag a third time within a 10 day of the second attempt, the bag devours the object, sending it sending into a void disappearing from existence, and the bag cannot gain, cannot again be used for a 10 day. Any additional attempts to store an object in the bag results in this again, resetting the cooldown back to another 10 day before its next use. <laughs> That's funny. Once Dude, per day as an action. Uh, oh, I'm, lo I'm looking at this table right here. It's a <laughs> yeah. it's a percentile table. Mm -hmm. It's 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 interesting. <laughs> Let's see. Once it, per day as an action, <laughs> someone can reach into the bag and remove something from it. Roll one d hundred and use the table below to determine what is removed. Anything removed from the bag is permanent to the plane and will not disappear within it after a time limit. If it's, uh, if it's another item or a creature on the plane, see the monster listing for the creature statistics. A creature removed is prone and immediately hostile, as it is scared is confused, but may potentially be persuaded to be friendly. <laughs> so I I don't know if I should go through this entire list, but I think I'll just go through uh, it. Let's just Maybe highlight ever... some of it, because I'm looking at this, and we ten? got like a, a recently caught salmon, a giant spider, yeah, yeah. A, a pint of milk, an empty spell book appears in your hand, like got a golden a... flute. 
A random plus one weapon, a deck of illusions, Ooh, roll a, a fireball, a portrait of a nude halfling woman, a knight in golden plate armor, <laughs> oh. a, a small bit of snow, <laughs> a diamond worth a hundred <laughs> gold, a small rubber a ball, a, a white dragon wormling, a skeleton, <laughs> a thunder wave scroll. <laughs> You pull a white dragon wormling from the fucking bag? Holy shit. So you can uh, get So I looked up the bag because I needed to know. And apparently yeah. one of the items is a pristine blue dragon egg appears in your hand and after twenty days the mother comes looking for it. Yep. I yep. love it. So loot bag is uh is uh, is interesting. You wanna give your party something to little fuck around with them a bit? Give them this. Oh, fuck they around, can fuck, fuck around open. and find out. Look at this shit. Yeah. A pair of ruby slippers appears in your hand. A bucket of chicken falls to the ground. <laughs> a scroll of fairy, fi fairy fire. A couple of silk ribbons. A set of shackles. A vial a of wolf blood orc, uh, in holding hand. a great axe. <laughs> a deck of playing cards. Upon collecting all of them, you discover all the two, six, and nines are missing. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> A bag oh, of holding bag. falls. Oh, what? <laughs> Wait, were we the same one? <laughs> a beautiful elven woman. <laughs> and oh, your hand is holding her right ear. <laughs> amazing. So just just a fun bag of fuckery. Honestly. A half I'm all for plate it. of boar ribs. <laughs> I'm all for this. An orc's toe. <laughs> 30 platinum? Holy shit. <laughs> 300 so counterfeit gold. gold. <laughs> a small plastic card with 16 digits, the Rame Robert Paulson, and a Visa logo appears in your hand. You have no idea what this <laughs> is. Just don't forget those three little digits on the back. Wait, a <laughs> container of dust of sneezing and choking? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I love it. I love it. A slinky made of silver. Hey. A moldy piece of bread. <laughs> A note that reads, his bag is nothing but trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Th this is amazing. This is the kind of fuckery that I like in a game. I, I, yeah, it's great. A wooden peg. Like, what, like, it's random shit. Portrait of a nude halfling woman. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. I was like, yes. Oh, man. So, yeah, just, just like, I like that one a lot. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> mm. I, I think uh, mm -hmm. going on to uh, more homebrew stuff. I'm like every. I'd say uh, going beyond homebrew. Uh, Ramen Packet Games has really got it going with all the games that they're making. Like, hot Absolutely. damn! Why? Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have our games. We have our radio show where we play test these games. You can hear the stories of ponies and balloons, mm -hmm. robots, and. First, telling your players that they're basically Nazis, then realizing that there was an invitation <laughs> to kill them. Or, like, whatever games get sent across our desk, we love to play. And anybody listening, please check these guys out. As you can tell, they seem pretty fucking cool. This stuff sounds a cool. Absolutely. Before I forget this week, though, I am going to dive yeah, into yeah. our Describeify. Oh, yeah, but you ended out with your Describeify. <laughs> well, you know, uh, a word that I haven't seen much of, but I feel like could be very useful in the DMing situation is furrow. Uh, do, you, do you know what a furrow is, Sam? Not to be uh, mistaken for furfurrow, the Pokemon. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, keen distinction here. So a oh. furrow is a long and narrow, kind of a shallow trench in the ground. Uh, typically like a... Like, what you might see made from uh, a plow, like, say, if a farmer's plowing their field, it, that leaves a furrow through the field. It's kind of like a rut, a groove, kind of a narrow depression. Or, in some cases, like, you're describing a uh, NPC's face, they their their eyebrows might, cr like, start to furrow. And you know, like, how, like, some people get, like, those little, like, deep uh, wrinkles in the forehead? Yeah. 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 The, you'll, they'll cr you'll see a furrow form in their forehead, you know? Like I, I can't do it, but <laughs> can't do it. I can't do it without like scrunching up my nose. Like, <laughs> nah. Like the the most I get is like a little, you know. Like, <laughs> but I I guess that's just how my my face is. Mm. Give give it a, give it another decade. 
If you can make a furrowed face, post a picture and tag us in it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We'll, we're just going to get a an entire... We're going to get tagged in every face frown possible. Um, <laughs> I've, yeah, I've heard furrows described as like, oh, a frown formed in their forehead. Makes sense. <laughs> I'm like the, uh, fast the furrow. Is. The furrow. Do you think you've gets. ever made a furrow face? Uh, mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> right now, <laughs> he's like, "I'm doing it right now." <laughs> now he gets that exact expression when he'll be in the middle of a narrative scene and get um actually, and every time oh without fail, God. the furrowing will happen. I feel that yep. <laughs> when someone like interrupts you and goes like, "What'd you say?" <laughs> the um actually is very real. I think I'll just buy a mask so I can just like stare at them ominously. Oh man, the Don't dream you have a of a mask. mask in the mail for exactly that. Like a I want a plague doctor. Yes, mask. it's coming tomorrow. Amazing. You're uh, living Sam, my dreams. You're gonna love the scythe that I'm uh, I'm working on for you because like uh, remember I picked that one up uh, last week. It, I found it in, inside a tree. Ah, true, true. You did find it. I, I want to kind of like uh, refurbish much. that, like, uh, you know, sand it, get a good lacquer going, put a little stain on the handle, Absolutely. and like uh, clean up all that rust. Yeah. Then you could hang it on the wall with the plague docker thing and the little bathroom uh, oh, uh, poster. Oh, amazing. Yes, I agree with this wholeheartedly. Mm. It's amazing what you find in random hollow trees. This is true. That thing is cursed. You know this, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely cursed. There's a soul in that blade. Uh, well, you, you know, I happen to be one of those people, like, if I'm walking somewhere, I'm going to find weird, random shit. But yeah, I think if we don't have uh, much else to go over, it's kind of uh, those are the stuff. Well, hey, plug your stuff, guys. Uh, tell us yeah. uh, where everyone can find you. All right, so we've managed to make it that you can literally just Google Ramen Packet Gaming. But <laughs> also, if you look us up on itch.io, that's our central base at the moment. You can find us over on Ramen Packing Gaming on Twitter, Ramen mm. Packing Gaming on Linktree, and mm. hopefully at your local game store soon. Hey, I'm looking forward to at that. Least two stores, so that's something. And hey, we if you need more playtesters, we have. If you need any playtesters, we have a whole server full of uh, gamers ready to go. This is Good true. No, mm. this is very, very true. We, we gladly volunteer our server as tribute. Yes. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed this episode, of Dungeons and Talk shows. We yeah. talked about the Beholder and met Ramen Packet Gaming. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Everyone, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy your weekend, guys. I'm going for noodles. Bye. <laughs> Bye.